Welcome to another Keel Hauled Podcast. I'm your host, Captain Logan, and we've got a lot of Sea of Thieves news to cover today, so tie yourselves to the mast and hold fast. Ahoy there, pirates. I hope you had yourselves a good week and a good weekend. I know I did. This week, I have none other than Luke Lore, the insipid ghost from the Xbox Expansion Pass podcast, joining me to talk about the Steam client, uh, his jumping into the Sea of Thieves hitting Pirate Legend uh, after so long after the game's been out for a while, the Sea of News video that we got, the next update, all that and more on this week's episode of Keel Hauled Podcast. Um, but yeah, I wanted to bring you on because um, I've been listening to I've been listening to Xbox Expansion Pass since a little after you started it. I think it was literally the episode that you did with uh, CJ for Player One Podcast that I heard it, and then he's like, "Yeah, you should go listen to this," and I'm like good i need an xbox podcast to listen to because there aren't (laughs) too many that i've listened to that are like good so i was like well i I, if if cj approves then i'm gonna go for it so i i listened to yours and i was like man he just he nails he nails the format he knows exactly what he wants to say he sell he he sells it really well and it's just a really well-made podcast so after that, I was like, well, dang, man, I just I want to I want to be invested in in what you're making and stuff. But um, I wanted to bring you on for a couple of reasons. But first off, I wanted to give uh, the floor to you to kind of to kind of promote what you do. So you've been making Xbox expansion pass for a little bit now, but uh, it's not your first foray into podcasting, if I recall right. No. Uh, so XCP started almost a year ago. It's been a weekly show for, and I'm on episode 48 is the one I need to record this weekend. Uh, but that is not my first foray into podcasting by any means. I did a show called the Xbox drive with a friend of mine named Sean Capri, uh, for about a year. And when we decided to, to part ways and kind of create separate projects, I wanted to make XCP and, and I split off to, to start that. Uh, but several years ago, I would say, oh, goodness now. Oh, goodness. Uh, 20, 2011 through 2013, I was hosting uh, tw- twice a week, roughly, uh, a show covering Major League Soccer. I worked as a journalist and reporter for and with Major League Soccer and North American Soccer all around. And I would often have, very similar to XCP, I would have on relevant voices in that world to the show. So I would interview players and general managers and uh, people from around the sport. And, and that was a, just an eye-opening experience to learn how to ask questions, how to speak to people. I certainly got, uh, I got corrected many a time in the world of journalism as it, I was new to it, my degree, of course, being in education. And it was an absolute blast. I loved it. I missed it. To get back into video game podcasting in 2017 or so meant the world. And then to start XEP and, and go back to that format that I like where you have conversation with, with with somebody relevant to that world is is just something I, I thoroughly enjoy. And I appreciate you checking it out and for the kind words. Thank you. Oh, it's my pleasure. I, I enjoy all the interviews that you in fact, some of the interviews that you have with voice actors from Firewatch or developers uh, from from a vast array of games uh, is has been really impressive. Like just the the sheer amount of people and talent that you're pulling in is amazing and every story that they tell to that that they tell is really excellent and the reason i kind of stumbled there is because i was i was thinking in my head of super new super lucky's tale and having the Mm -hmm. discussion there was really kind of interesting because it 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 made me really think like oh man i i need to go on to game pass and try out super lucky's tale and then when the new super lucky's tale came out i was like oh well perfect now i've got an opportunity to play the the version that they wanted to get out in in on the xbox so i was like sweet that that really kind of opened my eyes to it because for a long time it had always been like a a vr game and i i wasn't kind of keeping too close of an eye on it but because of the interview that you had uh it really kind of made me uh want to jump on and and actually try out that game so i wanted to that Oh, that makes ahead. my day. I just have to tell you that absolutely makes my day because that's the goal is that so many of these developers and uh, creators in this world, they create because they love it. And sometimes they can't get the game out they want right away. Sometimes it takes time. And 
you know, that's a, that's a great example, New Super Lucky's Tale, of hearing Paul Bettner's story of starting way back when at, I want to say it was, oh, Assembly maybe? Are they working on Halo Wars and some other stuff. Then going through, he created words with friends. And yeah. then he ends up at New Super Lucky's Tale and he's having a blast and just making this happy game. And those are the stories that are so exciting for me to hear, big and small, because they just, they warm your heart and they remind you that, you know, gaming and the gaming space is meant for goodness. And that's a good feeling, you know? Yeah, definitely. It, it, and it, it's good to know that they're open to discussing the game as well, too. Um, having their voice out there can really make a, an impact on when you're just scrolling through a list of new games on Game Pass and you're not sure quite what you want to dive into, sometimes just having a bit of background on the game can make a huge impact on whether or not you decide to download that one or you try out another game. And you do a really good job of kind of uh, picking and choosing. I, I still think the um, the interview with uh, Chrissy Jones was was one of my favorites because, well, for one, she's got an amazing voice. Uh, but just hearing the story about Firewatch and her, her diving into that, it was, I, I was really cool to listen to after playing it and knowing kind of the context of, of her situation in that game. Um, because it just, it, it was so, it was so unique, you know, you, uh, how often do you get to a chance to talk with someone who voices something? I got an opportunity to talk to the voice actress for, uh, Zelda in breath of the wild. And it was it was a cognitive dissonance between like looking at her and hearing Zelda's voice and being able to talk to her about what kind of gave her that, that uh, the, the inspiration to play that the role, the way she did in the English version. But it was just, it's, it's so cool that you're able to pull in different people. Meanwhile, you have a whole other part of the, the podcast that is dedicated to xbox news and you you do it so well and you keep it so clean and tight that it's nice to know that like i can drop in have all of the game news loaded up right at the beginning get to hear your thoughts on the 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 halo infinite news or uh series x and then afterwards i get to sit back and kind of relax and just enjoy a, like a really nice in-depth interview with uh, someone from the industry and just kind of get a chance to to see inside or you know kind of behind the curtain it's just, it's so cool i really appreciate that well thank you man i i that makes my day because xcp is about being analytical and and not not swooning and swanning over what what should be or isn't and and i really enjoy you know when being critical of xbox or microsoft when they need to be and then celebrating as many many things as we can in the gaming space and I also, when you make a podcast about a topic like Xbox, it's very easy to say, oh, well, that's PlayStation news. We're not going to talk about it. That's Nintendo. Why not? Or we're not going to talk about it. And oftentimes I feel that many times those are things that are related. If PlayStation now is changing, does that impact Game Pass? If, you know, Nintendo is releasing all the Mario games completely unchanged and everybody's rushing to buy it, is that consumer friendly if they're not doing anything? Meanwhile, you have other collections that are having love poured into them as their rebirth, you know, Activision with Tony Hawk, and then of course you have the Master Chief collection and a few others, the Spyro collection out there. Do we celebrate that? And I think those are relevant conversations to have even in an Xbox specific space. It's really interesting how sometimes you think that people don't want to hear about other consoles and then come to find out just having little bits of information interwoven with the Xbox news uh, can still kind of give you that basis for comparison. Uh, so often it feels like with console generation launches coming up, a lot of the the community still harbors on the idea of uh, one one company winning over another company. And sometimes when you are doing a podcast and it's purely about one company, you tend to end up with that echo chamber where they try to avoid talking about what they're playing because it's not on uh, the console that they're that they're actually uh, talking about on the podcast. And if anything, I feel like it does a disservice to the the companies that are building the games for us as opposed to 
you know, where does the allegiance lie with with the actual console? And and it's nice to know, like, if you're a fan of the Mario games and you're looking forward to the collection like I am, I, I have to look at it compared to, like you said, Tony Hawk and say, like, you know, what they did with Tony Hawk was far better and, and exceeded anyone's expectations on what you would what you would look for for a, a skating game remake but they were so passionate about how they were making it that they wanted to stay so 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 true to form with that game and then i look at you know super mario brother collection i'm like well it's great that it's coming but it's the it, it was the bare minimum they they up the textures they they made one of them widescreen format but they're charging full price for these three games that are really old and Sure, you can argue that the difference between, you know, does a game retain its value or how long has it been out? But it, it really does just come down to me feeling like Nintendo is trying to charge what they know they can get for it. And people will plunk down the money because these games have been trapped on older consoles and have not been given any kind of uh, support to try and create something unique about this this celebration that they're quote unquote offering us with this 35th year anniversary exactly and why do we as gamers forgive that and then punish others for it and and i don't have a good answer for it and i, I think it's worth noting but i mean here i am pre-ordering you know the mario collection because i want to have it i've never played sunshine i have no way to play it and yet they are doing the bare minimum and it is very i don't want to say anti-consumer but it should at the very least make you question if your dollar is being appreciated in the same way that it is in other places and a theme that i'm i'm going to be talking about pretty extensively on xcp this week is the power of ip you know you look at microsoft right now uh arguably the weakest ip slate of the big three and they ha- are doing a number of consumer friendly things putting their games on steam of course sea of thieves you know hit that this past summer and putting a number of their games on PC as long as well as uh, accessing backward compatibility, forward compatibility. They're doing a number of consumer-friendly things with free upgrades and smart delivery. And they have the most powerful console on paper. And that doesn't seem to be moving mindshare, whereas Sony has been kind of in the middle of all that, in some places very progressive, in other places really holding themselves back. And their IP is so strong, people are buying PlayStations at a rate of 2 to 1 compared to Xbox. And then Nintendo can... can in some ways get away with murder just because they've got Mario and some incredible games within that like breath of the wild is one of the best games ever made. I feel, and they can do some things that almost feel anti-consumer and yet we reward them. And it, it speaks to the power of IP. And if you are lacking that, uh, it certainly hurts your credibility amongst gamers, casual and hardcore, uh, and, and where they want to spend their money. And more importantly, I think, their mind share because that mind share is what's infectious to other consumers around them yeah you're 100 percent right it, it feels like because there's that nostalgia there's that that attachment to a company that's been with you throughout your years that you're willing to let them do just about whatever they want because they hold the keys to the kingdom uh disney's a perfect example of holding our childhood at hostage and scooping up companies that own, own ips that they can then spin into whatever content they want and we have we have no say in it we can we can you know we can kick and scream and you know hold our pitchforks and torches and go on internet and and express our discontent and it'll definitely make the question the, the companies question what they're doing but at the end of the day if they don't know what they want to do with it and they're just getting the ips and holding them hostage it really doesn't it doesn't do a service to the consumer, the ones that the, the people that are looking for that fan service, if they can't execute properly. Um, especially I look at, you know, Sony PlayStation has been touting the, the PS5 for a while now and expressing how their DualSense controller is going to be the only way to play PS5 games and that those are going to be the best way to play PS5 games. And they've got that that, you know, really kind of adaptive trigger with the haptics to try and give you a sense of of uh how you're feeling in the game and they're not addressing the fact that they're using ps3 move controllers for their ps4 vr system that is not getting an update for their ps5 and i just have to scratch my head and wonder what kind of snake oil salesman deal are they making with consumers here why are they selling them a new console with a brand new controller that you 
you can't use your old controller set like you can with like Xbox, but they're completely ignoring an entire portion of their community. Granted, a small portion, but a portion nonetheless of uh, of, of, of VR consumers that want to have in a full experience with you know actual finger triggers and and proper controllers for that VR experience and. I keep looking at Xbox to kind of bring it back to them and say like, hey, you know, if you've got an Xbox One controller, if you've got a Series X, uh, then you're good to go. It doesn't matter what controller you use. You can use the adaptive controller for all we care and just play the games and not have to worry, is this compatible? Because it's if you think it's compatible, it's compatible. And I love that. And I, I think the the biggest counter argument to all of this and kind of the thesis i have on it is that if you're making god of war horizon zero dawn if you've got a a vr system in a space where nobody else does you can get away with that uh xbox is not making god of wars they're not making spider-man ps4 they're not making games that are speaking to that same caliber because their business model is different and i'm i'm very rewarded by their business model because it's a personal interest of mine to play Halo and Gears and Sea of Thieves and, and, and a few others. But when you have that powerful an IP, it it allows you far more leeway. Microsoft is doing so many consumer-friendly things, and Sony is now picking up on some of that, including uh, putting their stuff onto PC, which is the right choice all around for everybody. Everyone should be doing that. Uh, it doesn't seem to be damaging the console space at all. And it just speaks to just what you can do with your consumer base and what they will allow you to get away with if you're able to play games of that caliber on their console. And then the part that we're ignoring is that marketing deals are going Sony's way because they're willing to spend the money there where seemingly and presumably uh, Microsoft is not. I don't know. There's, I'm sure there's insider aspects to that, but it's, it is just an interesting conversation to have looking ahead into next gen as to how our gaming will change what we'll be playing in six months, uh, six years, and and somewhere in between that. It, it, there's a lot of questions up in the air, and how gaming communities respond to that, I think, is the most interesting part of of our entire medium. You're you're speaking truth, man, and it's hard to argue uh, what's going to happen with Xbox post launch. But I have to pose a question that I think is on everyone's mind. I personally uh, have my own thoughts, and I'll, I'll share them afterwards. But I'm interested to hear what is it that Xbox um, is has in their back pocket that they can use to try and garner interest into people picking up a Series X at the end of this year. Because as we knew going into uh, this month, that we still don't have dates or prices. We have good estimates on both, but. For the most part, uh, that doesn't address the fact that the the biggest boon to Xbox right now is Game Pass. They don't have the halo that they that everyone was kind of looking to as the justification for the hardware outside of the hardware just being the the best, most powerful hardware that you can pick up right now for console systems. So in your mind, what are you looking at? Uh, for Xbox and thinking like this is the thing that will help justify the upgrade to a Series X. They'll have to package their entire next gen messaging together with with a lot of smaller parts to make a whole because Halo Infinite was to be that game that sold your your console and your next generation. Uh, there are a lot of conversations around why Infinite didn't do what it was supposed to do for for the majority of people. I mean, I was very encouraged by what everything I saw sans the pop in. However, it didn't land with the masses, and whether it was COVID related or otherwise, uh, something wasn't right there. And I would imagine we see it a year from now, not anytime sooner, given given the, the choices that Microsoft has made since their delay. And in moving into this next-gen launch, we are understanding that xCloud is going to be launching with Game Pass Ultimate, I believe, mid-September. I want to say September 15th, but I'd have to look that up um, to clarify. What they need to do on or around that date is announce the price. The prices need to be competitive. Nothing more than 500 for that X, uh, that, that Series S that is all but confirmed now in an embarrassing fashion, I would argue. Uh, that needs to be very competitive, competitively priced. 
versus the PS5 digital edition. It needs to be far lower than even that. I would say uh, you're looking at a 300, 500 set of SKUs between S and X. And if possible, get it down to 200, 400. I don't know how much Microsoft can eat costs. Those, those machines are very impressive with their velocity architecture. But on or around the 15th, when you are celebrating xCloud rolling out to people, you need to discuss uh, your launch slate of games, and you need to be touting Game Pass galore. Gears Tactics needs to be a day and date available on Series X when that thing launches, and then if you have an Xbox One and the console version works there, great, that's fine. But they need showcase pieces. I don't know if Microsoft Flight Simulator is destined for Series X on day one, but it needs to be a launch window game. Uh, the upgrades to their already impressive amount and quality games that are in Game Pass are not enough to move a system. I mean, Gears 5 is a, a fantastic video game, but it, didn't, it doesn't have Fortnite numbers. It doesn't have Call of Duty numbers or anywhere close to that. And so seeing an upgraded version, that's going to be like, man, this is really pretty. Pretty isn't a new experience, though. PC gamers have that. Uh, so what I would do is honor around the date of xCloud, I would be touting Game Pass and reminding people what Game Pass brought them this year, which is Wasteland 3, Tell Me Why, Flight Simulator, Battletoads, Gears Tactics, Minecraft Dungeons, Age of Empires 3 Definitive Edition, uh, mid-October, and then uh, what Crusader Kings isn't available, and talk about some of your third-party relationships for top-quality games. None of the games in Game Pass are universally revered. You don't have a Call of Duty in there. You don't have uh, a Fortnite-style type game that that matches that so you need to talk about all the, the the niche aspects of what game pass brings you battletoads is a fun video game if you like brawlers and beat-em-ups did the metacritic blow anybody away certainly not um but talk about why game pass is special why xcloud changes the game there you know tout up your relationship with razor talk and showcase people playing sea of thieves and other games on pc on an xbox one on a series s a series x all at the same time, talk about those things, show those things. And uh, beyond that, hope, hope for the best. I mean, there's no reason to think that Valhalla won't run best on a Series X. There's no reason to think that many of the other third-party games won't at this point. Uh, and, and really, dude, they need to spend the money on those marketing deals. They cannot keep losing so many marketing deals to PlayStation. Uh, and all of this amounts to Microsoft needs to spend cash and they may not want to eat cost on every single front. They're probably picking and choosing. And right or wrong, we won't have the benefit of hindsight for some time. I, I, I think that's the best case scenario for what they've got at the moment after losing Halo. And it's a good lesson for why Halo Infinite and, and no game specifically should carry your entire launch. PlayStation is teaching us that with Ratchet and Clank in the window and Miles Morales on day one. You need more than one game. You can't just have one and then hope it makes its launch date it's too too fickle an industry for that so it's interesting that you bring that up because i look at uh nintendo and breath of the wild breath of the wild was their launch title uh, if you didn't want mm -hmm. breath of the wild then you had a few indie games that were on the, the one shop. two switch one two switch <laughs> yeah exactly the the demo that refuses to go away um i i'm totally agree that that they really do have to kind of uh, go with the whole package. And I'm starting to wonder if we need to have a big shape shake up as far as uh, what companies are working on what IPs. It feels like Microsoft has been on the back foot for uh, launch of the Xbox One. And the thing that keeps pushing me to think that this company is going to do do well this this generation is just that they are coming at it from a unique approach that allows people to adopt the ecosystem in their own way and i think that you you saying that september 15th would be a great time for when they kind of release the date and the the price for the the series x is really really hits hits well you know can celebrate x cloud coming to android and also announce the the pre-orders are available and the date and the price for series x and talk about the series s and how you have mobile you have a low entry price point with a system that'll probably be close to be on par with the xbox one x and then the the best console that you can buy 
for all of the third party games that are going to be launching this fall. There's a ton of games. And it's funny that a lot of this console war is so hung up on exclusives because you can get the other games on any system that that's available sans Nintendo. But it regardless of you know which one you pick on xbox is going to offer the best experience it's going to have the most powerful system so if you want all of the 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 fps's and you want all of the 4k's the that's going to be with the series x hands down and that's why you should probably with, be buying with the caveat i'm sorry i apologize for interrupting oh, but no, you're with good. the caveat that they're not forfeiting marketing exclusivity rights and my, my easiest example is one that's in, fresh in uh, most people's minds right now, Spider-Man in Avengers. That's going to be entirely on PlayStation. So if you want the best experience, are you getting that on Xbox or are you getting that on PlayStation? And it depends on what you value. Do you care about the character? Do you have to have that character to be satiated? Or do you need the frame rates and the 4Ks? Uh, do you want to play it via xCloud when you're not at home? Like that's Those are the choices that, that are being forced upon gamers now in a time where it looked like cross play was going to be the thing and cross gen and we were all going to get to just play wherever we wanted to and 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 that would be it and so exclusives do sell systems but now so do marketing aspects to to things and that's what scares me because i look at microsoft's 15 studios and man they have got some serious talent outside of kind of your main main thoughts of 343 or uh, obsidian or whatnot they've just got some talent almost universally across their 15 platforms but they need to produce and then we have to see the other stuff click in as well yeah yeah it's 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 apparent that there are a lot of projects in the works with all of the studios that they've picked up but nothing nothing is at the point where they can release it in the time frame that they need to and it, it kind of makes me wonder if there isn't still a little bit of life left in the current generation to afford us an opportunity to give us a really awesome launch for a Series X when Unreal 5 is available, when the new new uh, cards are out for, for PCs where they can start kind of developing and seeing like what can be pushed with the hardware that's going to be available with the NVIDIA 30 series. And... Mm -hmm. Maybe 2021 would have been a better year to launch a new generation of consoles when they had more time to really kind of lean into Halo Infinite and make sure that it's in its best best spot and give time for Cyberpunk to have its uh, ray tracing patch available or, you know, let some of the, the Ubisoft games, which will inevitably launch with major errors, but will be patched over time because it seems to be the the trend with their company to launch games that aren't quite ready but to really make them exceptional you know a year later and kind of have like this this better ramp up um to to what would be a really amazing launch whereas now it just feels like we should probably be addressing this console generation as something akin to the the same scorpio launch where if you had the system before you're good but if you're looking for that generational bump, then you would pick up the Scorpio. And it feels the same way with the Series X. Like the Series X is the the natural iteration, the new introduction of the better hardware of the same system, just with hardware ray tracing, faster load times, new UI, things like that. And it feels a lot like a phone iterations in that instance. So I'm I'm hoping that Microsoft gets the marketing that they need to to be able to start capitalizing on the the content that they do have and that they really start punching home that xbox game Pass is, is the best way to play games I, I can't tell you how many game podcasts i listen to lately that have been talking about spirit fair and how great spirit fair is and i'm like that's awesome everyone's playing spirit fair on the nintendo switch because it's portable but Every time they mention that, there's that that caveat that they're like, oh, but if you have Game Pass, it's on Game Pass. And I'm like, that is marketing share right there. That is that is power in marketing. Everyone knows how good of a deal Game Pass is. And everyone knows to go check Game Pass if there's a game coming out to see if it's available on Game Pass. And if it is, then they just play it there and they don't have to spend the money on any other console to play that game unless it is the only console that they have. So. I'm hoping that there's something coming out, but what are your thoughts on that? 
I mean, there's a lot to break down in that. Everything about this upcoming launch at the time of this recording feels like it it's not lining up the way anybody wanted it to. Not just the game of chicken, but Microsoft has now doubled down that November is their time. November will be the month. Uh, and Sony has changed their verbiage to saying late 2021 in a few places. Or sorry, late 2020, pardon me, in a few places. And a lot of indicators would have suggested we would have these consoles in you know late October, early November, had there been no pandemic. And I think COVID has a certain uh, role to play in that, that we would have seen these studios, I mean, amidst the 15 studios that are within Microsoft Game Studios or Xbox Game Studios and how many teams are within each of those uh, different groups, we would have seen games rolling out, you know, every two to three months from something Xbox Game Studio related. And now I think that entire timeline has been kaput. I mean, even in our Sea of Thieves community, we're seeing their timelines be disrupted because simply put, working from home works very well in some cases and not from others when it comes to transferring mass files and 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 moving things. It's just a matter of time that needs to be uh, allowed for these groups to work together. I cannot overstate how important it is that Microsoft continue to build a relationship with the PC community. Uh, they have to continue putting their stuff on Steam, work on getting it to the Epic Game Store, uh, and allowing Xbox Live integration to all of that. And I think that's the problem with the Ep Epic Game Store right now is they can't get Xbox Live fully committed in that particular arena. But it's it's something that needs to continue happening because uh, without a doubt, Xbox is a known and, and understood and accepted qu quantity in the United States and in, in Europe to a lesser extent. And the big, the big gap in their marketability comes from Asia. And they're working on getting xCloud into India, huge uh, market. They, Japan continues to be the vault that can't be cracked for them. And so what they seem to be doing is now pushing xCloud into Korea, which is a fantastic choice given their internet fidelity and the speeds that they're operating with and their affinity for mobile gaming. And if they can enter the Asian markets in that respect and then start pushing into Japan that way, I think you'll see a stronger, healthier Microsoft, which then will kind of round itself back to uh, the rest of the, the territories overall. So you were asking me earlier what they need to do with this next-gen launch. They're already doing a lot of that via xCloud in other places uh, in terms of getting the name Xbox out there, uh, partnering with, with various Nintendo publishing groups to, to get things like Ori out on other platforms, very smart, allowing the games that they purchased uh, from studios like Obsidian in Exile, meaning that Wasteland and the Outer Worlds are hitting other places, but Xbox Game Studios are related to that, are, the, are very important because what happens when you want the next Outer Worlds? You need to buy it on a Microsoft platform or buy it through Microsoft uh, or via Steam. Those are smart things to do. Uh, they just need to continue building those relationships. And yeah, man, this launch for, for consoles, it, it was absolutely shot in, in the foot by their scheduling and the lack of, of ability to adapt in that scheduling for something that is worldwide launching. I think the studios have done a very good job, all things considered. Uh, but it's just when you have so much riding on that, there's a lot at stake. And clearly not, no, no, no company was ready for it. I think Sony's, Sony's biggest game is Miles Morales. And uh, that is an expansion to a pre-existing game, an impressive game. And I'm fantastically excited to play it. Spider-Man cannot be argued in terms of quality, and this game already looks far better, but it's an expansion, and there's nothing wrong in acknowledging that. Uh, and I think we're going to have the same issues kind of over on the, the Microsoft side. Oh, it's a better looking version of what you might know, at least for the first six months. You've mentioned a couple times that studios are having to adapt to the the situation that we're in right now, and it's it's not it's it's really apparent in some cases that uh things have had to kind of been put at a slower pace and and we've had to kind of accept that you know studios have to transfer large files between different homes uh not even just the studio itself and no truer is that than what we're dealing with with sea of thieves and uh the reason why i wanted to to kind of talk to you about this is we we we've been playing a lot of sea of thieves lately and uh lately they've been having to inject uh spacer months into the content development uh plan that they have to kind of give themselves enough time to work on polishing events as they come out 
Um, you've recently been playing Sea of Thieves. You've jumped into it and been having a really good time with it. Um, I'm curious to know, as someone who's been following Xbox for a while but hasn't really uh, committed to playing much Sea of Thieves, what was it like getting in there, and and what was the thing that kind of hooked you while you when you when you first jumped back into it? Oh man, that's a that's a fantastic question. So in order to understand that, I have to go back a bit to when Sea of Thieves first launched. Uh, not my jam at first launch, and in truth, it really wasn't my jam for a long time because it's very difficult to play Sea of Thieves solo. And at, at its launch, there even the opening maiden voyage and the lack of a story just didn't didn't land like it just wasn't the same vibe and and the anniversary update is when i re-entered the world of sea of thieves and i just i fell in love with it but i didn't have anybody to play with and a lot of that is by choice i mean when you're very busy you choose very explicitly who you want to hang out with and nobody was truly interested in playing with me so i had a blast with sea of thieves for a good while i would just sloop it and have a good old time solo and and search for treasure. And I really enjoyed that. And there was a lot more content added in by the anniversary update. And I played for a good while. I mean, I I loved it, celebrated it, and just faded off because it's not a great single player game uh, systemically. Like you don't go back to it if you're by yourself day in and day out for, for months at a time. And I had been pushing my buddies who, Kevin and Joe, who are our wonderful people we've been playing, any number of games during the pandemic. I mean, we went from State of Decay to, I don't know, Rogue Company, Halo Wars. We were just playing everything because what do you do? You're stuck at home and you want to be responsible and shelter in place, but you're bored. And so in going back, I finally got them to to check out Sea of Thieves because I, I was telling them, I was like, yo, I've got a bird. It's a pet. There's an Emporium. You can change your character. There's new things in there. Things are glowy. And like, it sounds so <laughs> silly and shallow. <laughs> but glowy makes a big difference. Fire wasn't in the game when these guys heard about it, right? Like it, if, if there are those little things in this, uh, I don't know if cartoony is the right way to describe it, but certainly not photorealistic. And you've got things that glow and things that look cool. And I'm talking to them about, you know, this ship sets from this game and we love that game. So maybe just come try it. And when I got them hooked and I got them into the gameplay loop, I'm like, well, all right, we can go fight skellies. Cause that that's my favorite thing to do is to go do do skeleton forts and mm-hmm. uh so we we jumped in and uh we started playing and we learned the game together and it was like i learned a whole new game because all of my experience had been on a sloop uh or or jumping in with with super pack and uh being the the dead weight on his galleon kind of thing and he, he very <laughs> politely would he'd be like hey maybe maybe spin those sails a little bit hey you want to want to check your map it's on the radial and like just Poor guy sharpened me through so many a mission, and I had a blast with him. Um, but the biggest joy of Sea of Thieves is when you are discovering what can happen in a world that allows for so many different things to happen uh, due to its PvP VE scenarios. And so when we got out there together and we were fighting different types of megs and then get a ske- attacked by a skeleton ship, and then we would see an Ashen Lord in the distance and go fight that and then get totally wrecked by Flameheart's fleet. And then there's a ghost fleet and then this and then that and then this. And it was so clear that this game was finally the vision that they had wanted when the game first launched. And we have had the coolest voyages, the most amazing experiences, the most infuriating experiences. And it has been a game that has absolutely gotten us through these past few months and we've we all three of us have hit pirate legend now uh we're exploring what to do next and how we want to approach it we're looking at the websites we're watching videos it, it's really cool uh what an a persistent world that's not an mmo but has aspects of it can do for a group of friends and i i am loving that so was there a point when you guys started playing that you kind of realized that you were starting to kind of get closer and closer to that pirate legend marker in your career as a pirate and if if you did kind of hit that realization was there was there kind of a a more of a push to try and hit it at a certain point like what when did you realize like you were getting close and you you really wanted to push to kind of hit that that pirate legend status Yes, absolutely. So I, I was fairly far along, whereas my buddies were not. And that's just because I'd played, you know, with CJ or, or a bit uh, on my own. And 
the goal for me, because as a content creator, it's tough to review stuff for your own content. Uh, if you're if you're only playing one game and that was what was happening is I wasn't reviewing games the way I wanted to and checking out stuff. So I was like, all right, before Avengers comes out, maybe we try to get Pirate Legend. And that was kind of in the back of our minds. But every day we would text each other the word Yarg and <laughs> then uh, the, respond back with the question mark Yarg. And then we would just jump on and we would pick our boat and we brought a fourth in and, and we've learned the meta and we were we were not grinding for what we wanted but in our very amateur approach we're like all right who needs what faction okay we're just going to put up that emissary flag so that merchant emissary flag was up a whole lot for us not doing merchant missions but <laughs> we would we would hit flag five and and the bonus stuff because we would do ashen lords and skeleton forts and skeleton fleets and the stuff we liked doing we would push that thing along without necessarily doing the missions we didn't like and that was something we really enjoyed and then when we realized the meta of the game, we were like, oh, we're doing this all wrong. We're doing this way wrong. And uh, it, the littlest things from, from how to organize your barrels, uh, we played with Super Pack once, and then the next day we're all like, all right, organize these barrels. This is ridiculous, guys. <laughs> Get it together. And just the little stuff that, that creates this meta of you know how to properly park your boat, what to do in this scenario, that it was such a great time. And... One of our buddies doesn't like the tall tales, so we would do them without him. And we would go in and, and hang out. He doesn't like doing puzzles, so we would do different groups. We would just set up voyages for different ways. But, but by the time we all three hit Pirate Legend, everybody was comfortable in their role on the ship. Everybody was comfortable with what to do when we parked without having to say it. We knew who was repairing, who was on guns, who was on the wheel, who was changing, uh, who was changing around the sails. And that is the coolest thing because we could continue talking about our days or laughing, making jokes and, uh, you know, making friends and alliances and being betrayed constantly because we trust too much. And it was just such a great time, man. I love this game. It's funny when you get to the point where you stop concerning yourself with how to do things and you understand the underlying mechanics of a game and you can really start to kind of have fun with it. Um, so many times with Sea of Thieves, uh, you, you start to learn the the distance of a ship and how long it's going to take. So you start to start. You, uh, I was playing with uh, uh, Jim Leahy uh, from the Discord, and he and I a uh, few times have been looking at a ship that's coming in on us and we're in the middle of turning treasure in and we can gauge it and say like, all right, he's, a, he's an island out. We got about a minute. And a minute goes by and sure enough, they're getting close and we're like, all right, stop turning in everything. Uh, let's get on the boat and, and uh, deal with these guys. And once you don't have to worry so much about like, well, how do I do a riddle or how do forts work? And you can kind of start playing the game as a pirate. It really changes. Uh, at least it did for me. It really changes. It's my, completely different. Yeah. You, you start feeling like you're a pirate and you start looking at things as a pirate and you start thinking like, oh, okay, well, I know how I can handle this guy that's sailing in on me because I've got my ship perpendicular to them. I've got my cannons ready, the wheels centered and the anchors up so we can drop sail if we need to get out of there. But I should probably get these cannonballs since that becomes all second nature. So meanwhile, your friends and you are just kind of, you know, talking trash about what it's going to be like when these guys come in and how much you're going to, you know, uh, steal from them or, 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 you know, how the engagement is going to go. And you can concern your less self less with, uh, like making sure you know what button presses to, to, uh, you know, load a cannonball or, or access a radial and stuff. And you get to kind of enjoy the game in its natural state. It is. Uh, it's really neat because we would look at there were moments where we realized that it just clicked for us. And that came with uh, when we would look at the map. And in the first few weeks of us playing together, we're like, all right, we need to find where Devil's Ridge is. OK, OK, we need to go. All right, wait a minute. And then now it's like, OK, we've got a radial of eight things to do for an Athena's quest. All right, we need to go here, here, here and here. And our map guy is just bing, 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 bing. And like I can jump down and be like, nope, northeast. It's up there. That's where Marauder's Arch is. And it's it's neat because it's just second nature now. The radials are second nature and doing things are second nature. Whereas before, if we saw somebody on our boat, we would panic and fumble and then we end up waving when we went to shoot them. And 
Now it's it's totally different. It's like a completely different game within the same world because we understand the the little things that make Sea of Thieves so special. Yeah. And that's it's one of the things that I think has been great with having a community that is welcoming of new players and kind of, you know, you, you talked about CJ sure bringing you around uh, the Sea of Thieves and kind of giving you that that experience. But you also had some experience, so I'm sure that some of that knowledge was imparted to your friends as you kind of went around and and helped them kind of get comfortable with the game, I'm sure, as well. And, and learning from what everyone is doing, it's it's interesting that you you kind of talk about this uh, from from your perspective, because uh, we've we've been since August 19th, we've had the Summer of Sea of Thieves event going, and that's still going till the 30th. And a lot of the things that are entailed with that event deal with things that would be a good introduction for people trying to learn how to play the game. Because I feel like a lot of people tend to to not be too sure about what's going on when they jump in for the first time. Um, have you looked at the Summer of Sea of Thieves event? And if so, are you kind of tracking some of the things in there that have uh, have been offering you golden doubloons and titles? Uh, or is that kind of something that has been more on the passive side of, of your play style? It has been on my radar for sure. And because it's on my radar, um, it's also very evident that uh, this is something they need to fix because this event is super cool. But the only way to check your progress is to go online and check it. There's no in-game method of uh, examining that. And so it's absolutely on my radar. I've unlocked a few of the the feats of courage type uh, accessories. And I it's I like it. But it's a pain in the butt to have to pull out your phone and and check it there. And I hope that that's something like a quality of life thing they're able to address. They've done a very good job, I think, by putting in these events and giving people that are are longtime fans something to look forward to. I think that what was the most recent one? Hungering Deep? That's not it. Yeah. No, not Hunters it. of the Deep. That's right. Yes. So I just unlocked the last piece of that. Uh, we got enough shark teeth to get everything in that livery that we can get for right now. And I had to go to my phone to check on that. And so that was a bit uh, interesting to to try and track it that way. But as far as exploring the Sea of Thieves by way of events, I loved it. I thought that was a really cool way to get the the rare uh, figurehead, mm-hmm. the very specific rare figurehead by going in and checking out these little Easter eggs around the world. I want more of that. It was actually listening to your show that, that I was like, oh, that's very, that sounds far more manageable than going to a wiki and trying to figure it out. Um, so I think more of that is, should be encouraged and should be important. I love also one of the ways that I think it helps people adjust and adapt to the game is to give them something familiar. And that can come by way of liveries from other games that they like. Um, the State of Decay stuff I would love to get. Missed it when it was in game and now it's in the Emporium. So that's cool. But why not go and find a very acute and special island, very small thing where... I kill this one captain and then I get the sails. And then I'm like, oh, I love State of Decay. Now I'm going out and I've learned how to fight a captain. I've learned how to fight a specific ship or, or learn something within the game. Uh, the Battletoads thing is a really way to tie that in as well. I think the more crossover stuff they do that's not damaging the world of Sea of Thieves, the better it is to bring in players that uh, are unaccustomed or unfamiliar or not interested really in being a pirate. But wait, I can wear pirate stuff that kind of looks like this game, character or game from somewhere else. Uh, I would love to see imagined versions of, you know, what would a race car lovery look like, similar to Forza, you know, but still in the Sea of Thieves style. You know, that spinal or the the spinal figure I had was really cool for Killer Instinct and the gear stuff. Like seeing it piratized is, is a really neat aspect to I think bring players in in a way that maybe the more hardcore fans wouldn't wouldn't realize can bring people in. You know, you you speaking to having uh, livery sets from other type of games, which I think is something that the the Microsoft Studios does really well. They they have a really beautiful way of having a lot of games have crossover with uh, different IPs. You talking about having a specific island, a small island where you can kill a skeleton captain for the state of decay liveries. I I was it was like it just popped into my head. I was thinking, you know, how amazing would it be? If they had two events that were set up, one for Gears of War, one for State of Decay, where one of them was a situation where you're on a specific island, probably an inactive fort at the time, 
and you have to deal with uh, a horde mode for the Gears of War liveries. You have to survive a certain number of waves. The waves continue. There's no end to them, but you have to get above a certain number of skeleton waves to start earning parts of that livery set. And, you know, it's still in the world, so there's still that that uh, impending doom of, of another crew coming and trying to mess with you. It would be uh, a way for you to, to earn Pirate Emporium content uh in game through natural means and same thing with the state of decay state of decay you could uh be attacked by certain skeletons and become infected and you have to figure out how you're going to find food uh to to kind of keep yourself alive until you eventually turn into a skeleton and then you have to infect your teammates or you have to get on your ship and then get onto another cruise ship and infect them. And then they have to become uh, infected for you to start earning parts of that livery set. Like having that, that crossover, but implemented in the game where it's not just a, a, a tie in with another IP, but it's an experience that helps kind of craft the, the story behind why you have these livery sets, uh, I think mm-hmm. would be amazing. And exactly. And that's how I think. And they've done a great job of it, to to be very clear. They've really opened that up a lot uh, in a lot of ways. But that's how you get players in who may not be interested. I mean, I I caught my friends when I said, hey, let's go do this tall tale so we can get this glowy red hull that looks cool and it looks like it's on fire, kind of. And then by doing that, we discovered other aspects of the game. You know, we, we were seeing more dynamic chests that that affect you. I'm thinking about the chest of rage and, and by seeing and playing with players who had cooler gear that they could wear on their pirate. Now we all have blue swords because we saw what Super Pack and, and uh, Mike Ors had and we were like, oh, that's super cool. And we wanted to go find that for ourselves, but it was because we wanted one thing that led us to the next, that led us to the next. And t- to me, that's just the neatest aspect of this game is we could do it that way. Or we could do it a completely different way and still have a Sea of Thieves experience. I mean, there was a night, dude, where we <laughs> we were on the seas. We're like, oh, maybe we'll do go do this fort. This this crew wrecked us, wrecked us, hit on our boat, just totally wrecked us. But they were really cool about it. And then all of a sudden, we're turning in stuff from another treasure, and they come back and they're like, hey guys, sorry we killed your thing. We'll open your ashen chest for you. And we're like, no, get off our boat. Not cool. And they're like, no, really, we're gonna ally. We're going to go do these things. Do you want to do this stuff together? We ended up with that crew for five hours. We did the Fort of the Damned four times because we had four ritual skulls. We had another sloop ally with us and a brig because we saved them from the skeleton fleet. They were getting wrecked. And we did it four times in a row and we all shared the loot. When does that ever happen? Right? Yeah. Like, when does that ever <laughs> happen? It's just neat stuff like that can exist within this world that is ever-changing and constantly persistent at the same time. Speaking of changes, um, we're going to be getting a new update on the 9th. Uh, We found out that the September update is going to not only have dogs, but we found out that they're going to be having uh, treasure vaults. And as mm-hmm. someone who's done the the Tall Tales a number of times, I absolutely love the puzzle vaults. I, I love the mechanic of trying to cipher out the the right combination of ruins on the pillars to try and understand like how we're going to unlock the Shroud Breaker pieces. And they're introducing that in the form of new Gold Hoarder missions. Uh, I'm already a huge fan of the X marks the spot and the riddle maps, but you know, it's been a couple of years. I, I know those by heart now, and I can generally find them within one dig. Um, having a new mission for me is exciting because it, it implements parts of the tall tale that I love while still focusing more on the natural PvE, uh, PvP VE aspect of the game where I can see someone and know that they're working on a gold hoarder mission that's a puzzle vault and not feel bad for attacking them because I'm disrupting a a tall tale for them. Um, Have Mm -hmm. you seen much on the the vaults of the ancients and uh, have any thoughts on them at all? Oh yeah. Oh yes. We we, right now we are glued to every bit of content that, that sea of thieves is putting out and we are so excited to see doggos for sure. Uh, That's, that's (laughs) an unrivaled thing that I'm super excited for. I will give them all the monies. Um, But (laughs) When it comes to these new gold hoarder missions, 
this is a great step to keeping your the game vibrant and alive. We've seen them implement things uh, in the past year or two that have worked and some that have not. I mean, some of us love the Ashen Lords. Other people, totally not fans. Now, this, to me, to be a persistent voyage as opposed to an, a world event is great because those of us who enjoy standard goal hoarder missions and then going on the tall tales for the puzzly aspects will now get those in smaller increments because it's a lot of effort to undergo a tall tale i mean that's a lot of time to put in to kind of one mission and those 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 vaults are such a neat part of those missions so it's great to see more people get to experience them i'm curious how it will be when people are, are rolling up in that that persistent environment what's going to happen to you is the treasure worth it is always a great question to ask but i'm all encouraged by the fact that we're getting another type of voyage within our gold hoarder faction because variety is the name of the game when you have a persistent online world and these vaults look really cool i love the indiana jones aspect and if you don't want to do them you don't have to that's the coolest part of it you know yeah i love the fact that the that they aren't changing anything about the way the game has its traditional voyages as it stands you this is just a another option for you if this is how you like to to play the game you now have this opportunity uh the the one interesting thing that i will say about this is that they're starting to uh introduce aspects of the tall tales into the game in the form of voyages but there wasn't much word uh about a, a, a comments that they had made in the past about wanting to implement some of the trap features from say like uh the 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 trickster uh or the trap maker mm -hmm. uh tall tale a lot of parts of the island that we have or a lot of islands have different parts of traps that look like could be easily implemented but I would love to start seeing things where the islands get to be a little more dangerous than just kind of the stagnant state that they're in and introducing uh, either time limited um, puzzle vaults or dealing with the typical skeletons and pirates. Uh, I would love to start seeing some variety to the type of things that can kill us in Sea of Thieves uh, when you're actually mm -hmm. on an island because at the moment it always just feels like it's it's skeletons at this point and traps would be an interesting take on that because then you could use those to your advantage if someone's chasing after you or skeletons are coming after you you could you know draw them into a trap essentially and utilize the trap if you're comfortable enough with how it works things like that but the you're you're absolutely right the enemy types though are something i want to touch on there and the methods of death when when you have skeletons be your primary environmental enemy in terms of like when you're not on your boat that is I think weighing thin for a lot of longtime players. And there are ways to to change that. Maybe in these vaults or around these vaults, you have ghosts, you know, and they operate the same way, but they look different. That might be a big way to change it. And one of the things that we constantly hear questions about is are they expanding the map? Is there a new thing to the north? Are we doing this? Are we doing that with the map? If these islands now have a second layer to them where, you know, down below traps exist and more islands are getting these types of vault type approaches. Uh, I think that's a great way to expand an already existing area to just have another layer for those who are interested and, and are want to explore more than than those who just see an island and move on. I would love to see uh, if if we are going to have skeletons as being kind of the the standard enemy type that we have. Um, I just recently finished up Halo Reach and. One of the things that I, I was introduced to, because I've only played the first and part of the second uh, Halo in the series, brutes were kind of things that, that were introduced in Reach, and I hadn't really experienced them. I'd seen them in videos because of Halo Infinite and stuff, but I've never actually had to fight them. Um, I would love to see a skeleton type that is somewhere between a skeleton captain and a skeleton lord, like a, just a, a big lumbering brute of a bunch of bones. Mm -hmm that is a little little tougher to kill uh hits a little bit harder but stays is, is faster than say like a an ashen lord um but is mixed in with other types of uh other types of skeletons heck i would even i'd even be okay with him being like a uh you know a keg skeleton and having him not walk with the kegs or chase you with the kegs but just chuck the kegs at you uh would mm -hmm. be an insane type of thing to have to deal with um i i'm curious to know like as as you've been playing the game um 
what are some of the things that you you've been enjoying as far as you talked you talked about like the skeleton forts and stuff as far as the trading companies go um do you have a specific trading company that you tend to lean towards and if so why we tend to lean away from merchant i think is probably the easiest way because merchant feels like aaron's the game Mm -hmm. um which is is not how we like to play typically now caveat to that is when i'm playing by myself or if i want if i have 30 minutes i'll jump on and do a merchant mission just to relax and sail the seas but we as a group like my crew we tend to go more towards the we like to to fight things that's that's what we enjoy doing um to that same point we don't like fight, fighting other people <laughs> like that's not fun for us we actually the pvp part of the game uh is is probably our least enjoyable aspect and yet the most important because the excitement that comes from Sea of Thieves is, all right, friend or foe, there's a boat on the horizon. What's it going to do? What are we going to do? How do we adapt? Uh, we tend to go towards Order of Souls to answer your question, uh, or Gold Hoarder, but even then, like we like to do Gold Hoarder, and, and specifically World Events is, is kind of our favorite thing. Mm-hmm. Um, boat type and crew size make a difference there, of course, but we like fighting stuff, and that's fun for us. Uh, and Sea of Thieves combat is so simple uh in terms of fighting skeletons specifically it's so easy and simple that it's just you can just fun and have a good chit chat uh but when we're doing something against fleets or boats or meg or when other people show up and they're not friendly that's a way different that's a way different type of combat than the standard just hack and slash have a good time very cool um I wanted to bring up the last thing that we uh, had kind of talked about uh, or that we got with the CN News update. They talked about introducing new ways of um, information or updates, content, uh, world events, changes to the world in general through the mysterious notes as uh, a way of kind of giving players an opportunity to not have to rely on Sea of News updates or you know, podcasts or YouTube videos or streamers or, you know, uh, outside means of, of informing the player. Um, do you think that this is something that is kind of a, a little like I'm, I'm happy that it's welcome, but I feel like it's maybe a little late in the process. I feel like this should have been something that had been in the game a long time ago. Um, do you think this is going to be enough from based on the video that we saw for people to get an idea of? uh enough information for upcoming events that they'll be able to understand kind of what's going on no i don't think so uh in fact i would say my first reaction to that was befuzzlement and something that i don't feel initially anyhow uh interested in even looking at or dealing with because that's that was never the the biggest thing that we enjoy was where the puzzly figure this out type aspects of sea of thieves which for some people that's the core of their sea of thieves experience and that's awesome too. When I saw that, I was just kind of like, oh, not for me. Fine, no problem. Mm. Uh, the caveat to all of that, of course, is that we've not seen it in implement, implemented use yet. We don't know how it will truly play out. At least I, I don't know if it's on private servers yet, but I mean, I've not seen anything to know how it will truly work. So I'll probably check it out and see how it goes. Uh, again, another aspect that we may not think of, um, even in my, I would say, far more casual approach, uh, to the game than than you and many others is that we are onboarding so many people into the Sea of Thieves community right now by way of Steam, which is, I mean, fairly recent, by way of Game Pass as that continues to grow. xCloud will likely bring out even more players in to the Sea of Thieves. And I don't expect that xCloud is the right way to play Sea of Thieves persistently, but it could get people into it. Uh, and then you have a console launch coming up, something we talked about at the top of the show. And I can tell you this, man, I'm most excited about these next consoles for loading times because Sea of Thieves takes a day and a half to load in. <laughs> and I would imagine they onboard a lot more people into this world uh, in the next three months than we probably would have thought about otherwise. So it might be the right time for it, uh, all things considered, because people are going to get new hardware and they don't have a whole lot of new games to play. They might check out some of that, that slipped by them or they let go by the wayside so i think the mysterious notes could be something special part of an overall package but i have a lot more questions about the mysterious notes than i do answers right now yeah there is a, a lot left to be said about those I'm, I'm interested to seeing 
how those will present themselves and if it's something that will be because one of the problems that I have with the current design implementation for quests is you can cancel any quest that you put down, but if you get a message in a bottle, there's nothing you can do about it unless you actually do it. And that's been a, a something that's been a hindrance to the to the folks that spend a long time on the same server and pick up everything. This adds another layer of complexity uh, or complex complexity. I don't know what I'm saying <laughs> uh, to to the to the UI. Um, we've already had a lot of the quests and uh, fishing bait cannons throwables double wheels emotes everything seems to be pretty loaded onto these these radials that we have and having one more on on our to have to carry around feels like it's it's kind of a strain on uh how many how many levels deep do you have to go to get to this and why isn't this something that's front and center on a poster board or like a, a call board on the outposts? You know, if you're not sure what to do, you head over to a giant billboard full of uh, notes. You see one, you uh, grab it off of the board, it accepts the quest, and then that gives you something that you can go check out. And as you progress through the game, you start to notice fewer and fewer things on the bulletin board until you get to a point where there's nothing left to check out until there's a new update. And then the new update has a brand new piece of paper and you go over there and you accept it and it kind of boots up the uh, the experience or the new content for you. Instead, it feels like this is all just kind of rammed into the the, the quest radials where I, I I already spend enough time digging through menus when I'm trying to grab stuff or look up things and I, I wish there was a little more of a passive way that I could do this without having to be forced into my menus. That quest board sounds perfect and something I absolutely want. As you're describing it, I'm thinking about uh, where it would be located on the various islands or outposts rather. And, and man, it gives you another incentive to go to the tavern, which I think there's not a ton of reason to be there. I mean, there's Duke and the Stranger, and if you're a legend, you can go down below. but that would be another great reason to to enjoy and visit the tavern. Uh, it certainly could be a, a lively board and bright and colorful, and, and you could put it into your radials, radials if you pick up the quest, and if not, it's not bogged down, because you're right, those radial menus are difficult to navigate, and I still can't figure out how to get chain shot without hitting start. Um, I don't think you can right now. Uh, it's, it's just strange. Uh, that they would want to overload that yet again. And I wonder if that's a time crunch thing or just a UI thing on the back end, or maybe they've tried what we're talking about and it, it doesn't work out. But I love the idea of a board on every outpost island that has the same quests for until you, you've knocked them all off and then you can go do them or not. That's That sounds ideal for sure. Yeah, it's I I, I love the idea that they're trying to do something that drives engagement um i i think you're 100 percent right with the idea that the series x is going to have a lot of onboarding for players and that because sea of thieves is, is done so well and is still so prominent in game pass that there are going to be people that decide to dive in maybe because they were on an original xbox and the load times were atrocious for them and having an xbox series x might actually impact their their feel of of loading into the game and not feeling so uh hindered by by hardware because of the design of the game compared to pc players who are on you know ssd drives and load in after being killed very quickly uh having a way for them to to find these mysterious notes and have a a drive or a reason to want to go out and check something out the the example given in the video was to go check out the laguna whispers and talk to umbra who kind of sets you on the the the, the trail of discovering the sea of legends um to which i'm hoping will eventually I'll, I'll be put on that list in the future but um i i really do feel like this needs to be a centralized thing it needs to be something that draws people to it when they first load in and, and i feel you're 100 percent right uh, as much as i hate duke the dark lord and think that he needs to be uh ousted as the the bilge rat representative 
I think that the taverns need more livelihood to them. They're dark, they're dank. There's uh, an air of mystery because of the stranger leaning against the door that goes to nowhere. Uh, the, the tavern keep, I've always felt that the tavern keep should be your, your gateway into the world. She should be the one that is calling you over when you load in because you always load in into a tavern and she calls you over and says like, Hey, by the way, there's something going on. I heard rumor from some guys that were just in here about this skeleton that's out there that they couldn't beat. You might want to go talk to the order of souls to do that. And if you're not sure, uh, they posted a thing over on the bulletin board next to the door, uh, grab that and take it to them. They'll explain more. And or or even saying like, hey, I heard there's an Ashen Lord over at Devil's Ridge or just something, something relating to the world that is happening. Like, you know, I think a skeleton fort is going to be uh, showing up soon or you know, the Kraken's angry today or something like that Ooh. would be a great homage to what's going on in your world events. And it makes you feel more connected. And like the systems within Sea of Thieves are more connected. Because they're very boring. The taverns are not exciting. There's no reason to be there unless you're turning something in or spawning in. And having more to do or a reason to check things out would be a blast. One of the, the coolest parts are when you need to gather a, a tall tale yeah. from a tavern. I, you know, like those, are the, those are the things that when ta tall tales first came out, finding where to start them was a pain. Like I could not figure it out without asking help or looking up a wiki. And it might seem so simple, but if you're not familiar with Sea of Thieves and you want to try a story, at first, navigating through all the voyage menus to figure out where to start the tall tale was a pain. Now they've added map stuff to it. There's, there's, there's incremental improvements that make all the difference to the content that already exists, and that would be a great one. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think we've touched on some things that I hope get their way to the ears of the devs and maybe we could get a little color on uh on if this is something that had been played around with and if so i would love to the the one of the main things i think i've always asked of the team if i ever get the opportunity is the ideas that the that the community has are very intuitive in the sense that it tries to speak to what would make make the game more accessible uh have a little bit of ease of access to to what we want to do in the world and a lot of the time we get fixes that are implemented for the sake of the community but a lot of the times we we tend to get pretty mute statements from the 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 devs as far as why things aren't implemented uh even today i was playing with uh, sightless combat mina ferry and our fourth uh, crew member lady ursula popped into chat as we were on the xbox ambassador stream and wanted to join us and we were we had been sailing for about an hour we still had a bunch of treasure and it's a bit to go to an outpost to turn everything in and then restart a server boot up a galleon and just the concept of being able to sell your ship or destroy your ship and dynamically change ship types uh, so that you can afford to have more or fewer people on the same server without having to sacrifice everything for it uh, is, is still a very, very much desired feature that I think that could be coming to the game. And I, when I look at something like that or something like a bulletin board or just making the taverns more interesting uh i i tend to wonder you know where are the efforts being spent and you know what are the the reasons for why some of the requests that have come from the community have been ignored or or at least just not addressed uh by the devs when when it comes to to future content more than once have i wanted that same ability to oh our friend wants to join us now uh we're on a brig and we've got a hole of treasure and and we don't want to stop our quest because we're halfway through it the ability to upgrade the ship um perhaps not downgrade it that might be a, a benefit uh or, or a, a hindrance to the game if you're able to just switch sight on scene no problem but once per voyage if you wanted to switch i feel like you should be able to i think the response would be Everything about Sea of Thieves is balance. You're never stronger than somebody else that spawned in, whether it's their first day or their hundredth or their thousandth. Uh, you're never stronger or weaker than the person around you. But the ships themselves are stronger, faster, weaker, more maneuverable. 
they have benefits. And if you've lost to a crew in an engagement or you're being chased to an outpost uh, by a certain crew and then you switch to a brig and you're faster, that could be damaging to the balance of the game. And maybe that's what they're trying to avoid. That said, I can tell you I would very comfortably give up the scenarios where maybe I'm able to to outwit a crew or, or whatnot to just play with my friends. Like I, I, if CJ logs on and he wants to join my buddies and I, there's three of us, but we're, we're halfway through our brig missions. The idea that we can't play with him unless we switch out, that's a pain. And that should be addressed. And I think you can sacrifice a bit of that balance for that sake, because why wouldn't you want more people to be able to play? And your friend that joined you, why, why wouldn't you want her to be able to play on your ambassador stream? And why wouldn't you want people celebrating joining people that they want to hang out with versus not you know? yeah yeah one of the one of the things that i've i've uh harped on a lot and i and i mean hold on i think my uh, no i can't reach my soapbox I'll, I'll try to keep it brief um having the ability to to purchase uh crates of supplies would really it's it's a, a give and a take that I think is something that I, I think needs to be at least played with in the idea, even if it just comes to insiders to give us an idea of whether or not it would be balanced. But I would definitely say that if you're willing to sail up to an outpost, drop anchor, unload everything and give up all your supplies for the ability to swap ships and then have a new ship load in after that one has sunk and it's been removed from the memory, have a new mm-hmm. ship load in have have the same scenario you know just like a new load in it the anchors down the sails are up there's there's bare minimum supplies it would really it would really put a hindrance on the people that are trying to abuse a system like that where they could switch to a different ship to be able to outmaneuver or outgun another crew that is encroaching on them uh and and if you could accept those um requirements for being able to dynamically change your ship, uh, provided that the server has the, the 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 actual space for that that size of a ship to be upgraded to, then mm-hmm. I would very much like to have the ability to to um, you know change from one ship to another and accept that you know I'm I'm going to lose out on the supplies probably, but we've got supply crates if I want to save those. Uh, but I'm more than willing to to drop anchor, scuttle the ship, wait for it to sink, and then ask for it to spawn in, and then have to worry about the anchor and the the sails. And it, it's not going to be something that's easy for me to drop in and drop out of quickly to be able to deal with a, another crew that's coming over. I would have to deal with that other crew right. first before I actually get that new ship. That would be an acceptable exchange for me if that was the case. Um, and, and while while we're upgrading outposts in this respect, I would love a repair <laughs> station at an outpost so that I can get rid of those all those cannon and tooth marks all over my hulls that inevitably happen to my beautiful pristine ship every voyage. <laughs> I would love to be able to dock and then pay a thousand gold and up oh, my hull looks good again. Yeah, yeah, it's not leaking, but it looks good. I would like that. Yeah. Where's that feature at? <laughs> Yeah, being able to reset the reset the ship and kind of get it refurbished, you know, get it back to to brand new would be really awesome. And you know, if we're if we're tossing out wild dreams out there, uh, you know, let's let's toss out the idea of being able to name our ship as well. You know, why not? If if we're if we're shooting for the stars, we might as well uh, go for go for broke and try and <laughs> try and get every. You want to know a fun secret? <laughs> Sure. You don't know a fun secret. All Pretty. right. So my gamer tag is insipid ghost, right? My the my pet monkey is polter. My pet bird is geist. So I got poltergeist there. Nice. And what I never tell my my crewmates, because I'm too embarrassed to tell them because they're gonna make fun of me, is that every time we leave, in my mind, I I my ship is named the apparition. Uh and and no one else knows that. It's the first time I've ever said that out loud. Uh, but I've always had it in my head. It's the apparition. And I always like say a little like salute to the apparition as we raise anchor and go out on our <laughs> our first voyage every time. I don't know what I'm going to name my doggo, but we'll, we'll we'll figure that one out too. But I got all these ghost puns and my ship has always been the apparition. It's just the game doesn't know that. Oh, that's awesome. Well, I have, yeah, I have two okay, recommendations <laughs> for, for your doggo, if you don't mind. Um, okay. Either, either Scoob or uh, Spooky Pooch. <laughs> well, we'll add them to the 
the contemplative list there. It's not a bad thought at all. I Appreciate like that. It. Appreciate I like that. it. <laughs> yeah, I, I totally am. I'm right there with you. I've, I've any ship that I've sailed in my mind has always, uh, I've always tried to go with the spinal figurehead. It's my favorite, but my, my ship has always been called the sitting duck in my mind. And I, ever since the game was in beta, my, my ship has always been the sitting duck. I would love to have the ability to, to have that on a nameplate a placard somewhere even if it's just like a little ship model in the cabin of a galleon that that says like hey this is the this is the 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 model of the sitting duck you know something like that would be awesome i i know it's you know it's not hugely impactful but in a game where i spend most of my time playing as a pirate i i generally don't think that my pirate is a character that i'm logging into to to level up it's like no, that's me. That I am that yeah. person. Uh yep. and and having little things like that would always help kind of just round out that lore, round out that 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 character that I have in that game because it, it feels like I'm playing me when I'm when I'm in Sea of Thieves and I just don't get that with any other game that I play. Uh and I and I kind of wish that I did from time to time. Look look, here's the thing. When you go to the Black Witch, that has the coolest nameplate mm. right there. That's another aspect of cosmetics that could be introduced into the game. And why not? You know, like, why not? You could submit them for review if you're worried about anything derogatory. But, like, if I want to to spend $2 in the Emporium to get, it, say, the Apparition or something like that, and then once I've got that name approved, it... I can buy cosmetic changes to the font or the color scheme. Like that would just be a really cool aspect or, or boost to the personalization of the game. Because when you have a persistent world, you want to feel connected to what it is you're using your player. Like you and I both, we think of our characters as us, but some people may be role playing and that like super pack wants to be a merchant out on the seas. Cool idea. You know, like mm -hmm. if his ship has a cool name, uh, that 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 is elusive to or alludes to him being a merchant. That's a cool. That's a fun thing, and it helps you immerse yourself even further into this world. Uh, I would love for them to explore that aspect. I think it plays a lot into the to the world of piracy. You know, when you saw a specific flag, you knew what captain that was. When you come across a, Sp a Spanish galleon, you would know it's the Hispaniola. You know, there's. There's reasons why ships were named uh, what they were named, and and a lot of it dealt with uh, you know superstition or or you know what uh, what ruler is commissioning the the ships, um, and and I would love to be able to look on the map, and in the same way like the Marauders map from Harry Potter has the little scroll with the name underneath the steps that are are representative of the person that's walking around Hogwarts. Once I come across a ship and I see it on the ocean, it has forever got its name on a little you know, waving scroll underneath of it that lets me know like, oh, well, that's the apparition out there. Okay, well, at least I know where they are. And, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here on the sitting duck. And now that we've been alliance or, or come in contact with each other, you know, there's a, an infamy to names uh, that can mm -hmm. that can be accrued. And without a bounty system the reaper's bones is just kind of a free-for-all on who you kill having a name to a ship can start to uh start to build a a, a sense of of ownership and and you know rapport you start to learn who are the good ships who are the bad ships and if that's tied to your character who's captain or you know the crew itself it can really add to that to that sense of immersion when you're talking about you know playing an open world sandbox pirate video game uh having more ties to your character and your ship really does uh lend itself to to wanting to spend more time in that world because you have that that personal connection to it mm -hmm. yep no, i totally agree with you are there anything or are, are there things in the game uh that that you would like to see outside of the things that we've discussed come to the game uh, i know you'd mentioned like the map expansion to to different areas or, or different enemy types uh, as i'm kind of wrapping up i always i'm always curious you know do you have 
like a, a thing that you would love to see as a game? And also, do you have a, a specific trade company that you love and an island that you love? Oh, man. Um, okay, so hear me out on this. I would like to see uh, a couple a couple things in terms of, of creatures. I would love a dragon to be in the game, an ashen <laughs> dragon, as it were. And I, I, I realize how silly that sounds, but you're fighting Megs. You're fighting Kraken. Imagine uh, an encounter where you on your boat are dealing with a dragon that has been held down by like flame heart chains or something like that and you have to adapt and move around to this this living creature or you could even set it up where it's in the water and, and it could be something you you battle on your boat but i would love to explore a bit more of the mythological creatures i mean the megalodons their version of them are very different um their version of a kraken is very different uh in terms of at least based on the the concept art for what see if the uses kraken looks like but I would love more mythological creatures to be to show up in the game. Mm -hmm. uh, at one point, I wanted to see whales and dolphins, but then I figured everybody would harpoon them, and I'm like, oh yeah, that that, that doesn't work. So having more fantastical oh, yeah. creatures might be a really neat way to to expand your interactions because I love when the Meg shows up uh, and ruins ruins my encounter with something or changes the dynamic or the skeleton ship starts shooting at it or we whoever's in an engagement we have to deal with that as well. But imagine a, a dragon that, that flew over you or, 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 and breathed fire or came up out of the water to swipe with a claw versus fighting you. Just little fantastical things in the Sea of Thieves style that I know Jonit and all of them could create far better than I describe it. I would love to see more mythological creatures on the Sea of Thieves. I think that would be a great thing. The Megs are really cool, but they're, they're the same thing, just color palettes every time, seemingly. Mm -hmm. So I would love more just creatures in the world. Um, or maybe maybe the dolphins are always out there and you can never get to them. I don't know. Some some way of uh, seeing that more often. And then persistent elements uh, of the world. Like there's a place that's always got sharks would be really cool. Like sharks are always just around this area. Um, something Ooh, yeah. something like that would be really, really neat. Just, just say if you, oh, you want to go swim through this thing and there's sharks, like there's sharks. You know, they seem to be somewhat random. And maybe these things exist and I don't know it. Um, no, they don't. But they, they should. That would, you know, just always sharks are here. Always yeah. this are there. Um, I, I'm i thinking about enemy types. I think we did some good, good ideas with that. The juggernaut-esque type approach to a bigger, larger uh, skeleton enemy. Uh, even like that undead island would be really neat to explore. Like what does a decaying pirate look like when it's not quite a skeleton? That'd be a oh, neat yeah. thing to look at. I, I like, there are things they can do with the assets they've got that I would love to see them continue to explore. Um, as far as a favorite Island, I, I said devil's Ridge earlier. I'll say devil's Ridge again. I like devil's Ridge. Um, I've had many an ashen battle there. I feel, <laughs> but, uh, so it's a really good uh, island i I don't blame you in the slice yeah. it's it's designed perfectly to give you that that feel of like there's a front and a back side to this island and and the back side is where you get the the little taste of you know there's a hidden world within the the actual rocks and there's a cave system mm -hmm. and the front is just a really beautiful pristine uh stretch of beach that you can you get this really nice lagoon a little waterfall it looks awesome so i don't blame you in the slightest it's a great island yeah awesome. i think so too I, I i love that island for sure well that's that's pretty much all the news that we got this week um next week we're going to be getting uh the the update um i will probably be diving into that uh deeply as we get a lot more kind of information on how these things are going to work out and i can't wait to dive into them uh luke i i appreciate you jumping in with me and spending some time talking about gaming and, and sea of thieves in general uh again please let people know like where they can get your content and where they can reach out to you oh absolutely uh you can find me on twitter at insipid ghost and uh insipid ghost on twitch uh as well but uh, really and truly, it would mean the world if any of you guys are interested in, in kind of the things we talked about at the top of the show, uh, check out the Xbox Expansion Pass. I love having on guests fairly regularly. I would say a third to half of all of my shows include 
uh, guests from around the industry, people like Stephen Spawn, people like Ryan McCaffrey, Andrew Renee, to developers for any number of games. I think Call of the Sea is coming out on Series X. Talk to them or in the Blind Forest developers. Uh, so many other developers just to spotlight them. It's, it's something I really enjoy doing. And that's the Xbox Expansion Pass on uh, any of your podcast services. It would mean the world if you checked them out. Thank you. And make sure you guys, if you do listen, uh, head over and, and give them a review as well to the, the five star reviews help a lot with the analytics for every podcast. And Luke, your show deserves it. Honestly, it's it's one of the few that I listen to on a regular basis because it, it makes it makes so much sense when I when I get to sit down and listen to it and just having your discussion there, even though most of the time you run a solo show, I can. 100 percent appreciate how hard that can be uh so it's it's nice to have someone else out there kind of speaking for the xbox ecosystem but keeping an open mind to the rest of the gaming industry um i'm going to have links to all of your content in the show notes if people want to have an easy access to get that content and with that man thank you so much i appreciate you just being on the show and joining me today Thank you for having me, man. It was an absolute blast. Thank you. Oh, it was my pleasure. Awesome. Pirates, I'm going to get back to you guys in a minute uh, after this uh, break, and I will finish up the rest of the show with you guys. So you guys have a good time and hang in there. And Luke, thanks again. All right, Pirates, that's going to do it for this episode. A little bit longer than usual, but it's one of those times where I actually got a chance to talk with someone who I love listening to and to be able to talk xbox news with him was a a true pleasure and i can't wait to have him on for other episodes like short leave episodes especially when other games come out or the xbox launch comes out i have so many plans so many ideas and so many dreams that i want to uh share with him and stuff so um if you guys like this definitely let me know i'd love to get your feedback on things um i appreciated everyone that reached out to me recently uh i had a lot of you reach out with some really awesome ideas uh so thank you to to skelly dog for uh writing into me and, and giving me a really good idea for some of the stuff that can be done uh with like skulls hanging from its sails or special lanterns custom nameplates things that we kind of talked about um i love the idea of of having different stuff come to the shops whether it be the emporium or for for gold as well too is really cool to to kind of read through your your comments i appreciate that and also um rye smith i got your email uh the show's running long this week um i want to i want to get your story in uh but i might have to to hold on to it as a as a a rainy day situation so i i love that you you're a a fan of the podcast and that you appreciate it um i've got your story it's it's being saved i'm gonna uh have it for when i i have stuff when there's a little less news and and i don't have to to kind of inform people about what's going on but thank you for writing to me if you guys want to write to me and give me your story as well, you're always welcome to do so. You can do like Rise Smith did and uh, send me an email at C-A-P-T, uh, L-O-G-U-N at gmail.com. Uh, if you want to hit me up on Twitter, it's at C-A-P-T underscore L-O-G-U-N. Uh, I've been streaming a lot more this last uh, week. Um, this last week I've been streaming World of Warcraft because they've got a reputation boost and I was finally able to get flying for BFA which if none of that made sense, I don't blame you in the slightest, but it was a huge, huge achievement for me to finally get flying in current expansion uh, for for the, the, the time that I have before Shadowlands comes out. And um, if you want to see me or if you want to come say hi, um, feel free to head over to twitch.tv forward slash C-A-P-T underscore L-O-G-U-N. And again, uh there's a lot going on with the show uh, i want to thank robots radio for all the work that they've put in to get me affiliate links if you guys aren't aware i have an affiliate link for green man gaming it is an awesome website to be able to purchase games through they have a ton of really good sale or uh, sales discounts i guess discounts would be a better way of saying that so you're not thinking of liveries but I buy a lot of games through there. It saves me a ton of money. And if you use the affiliate link, it gives me a a part of that that money that goes to the company because you went through me. Uh, It helps support the podcast a lot. Um, If you can't support that way, a great way to support is just through podcast reviews and uh, ratings. That helps out as well. Subscribing 
uh, to the to the feed on iTunes or following on Spotify, um, heading over to the YouTube channel and throwing a like on there and subscribing there is a great way to do it. Um, other than that, pirates, join the Discord. Uh, we've we've got the Discord link in the show notes. A lot of great pirates are in there. A lot of people playing a lot of different games. If you're looking for someone to play with, uh, similar to the, how Luke had to bug his friends and get them to to join up on Sea of Thieves, if you're looking for folks to play with, the Keel Hall Discord is a great place to see other people playing and join up with them. We've got a couple different channels set up for insiders, for arena, for adventure. Uh, be able to, to, to hang out, talk shop, talk Sea of Thieves with anyone, share news about anything that you want. And... If you just want to say hi, that's a great way to do it too. You can also message me on Discord. Um, you're more than welcome to, to send your stories like Skelly Dog did with uh, with his ideas about what could come to the game in the future. And I'll see if I can get some time to, to talk about those in the future along with the email. So Pirates, that's going to do it for this episode. Thank you. I love you. And I look forward to sailing with you on the Sea of Thieves. Radio Podcast. Smart shows for interesting people. Check out all the shows at robotsradio.net. Have you ever wondered how deep the Elder Scrolls lore rabbit hole goes? Have you got a grasp of the basics and want to find out more about the universe? Written in Uncertainty is here to help you. We'll be mixing in philosophy, theology, and whatever other theory is useful with Elder Scrolls texts to untangle some of the biggest questions in the series, like what are Dragon Breaks? How does Chim work? Where did the Dwemer go? And more. Check us out at writteninuncertainty.com or find Written in Uncertainty on any podcatcher. Thanks for listening and catch you later in the grey maybe of Tamriel. Hey Guardians, we are the Destiny Show Podcast, a weekly podcast about all things Destiny 2. We invite amazing guests from the Destiny community to share their stories and discuss the latest topics from the world of Destiny. Check us out on Apple, Google, Spotify, Stitcher, or live on Twitch every Thursday night at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. We will see you starside.